It's a pleasure to be part of the panel today about maximizing your scientific impact. I was asked to discuss self-promotion on social media, so we're going to jump right into this topic, which may not sound like a great idea. Um, most of us have probably been taught not to self-promote, um, but I'm going to discuss hopefully some strategies that make it more, much more constructive and hopefully um, add some benefit to your academic career. I have no financial disclosures. And let's just start out with um, um, hopefully a, a positive topic, which is you just published a paper. So after months and months and months of work, um, organizing all of your collaborators, you know, after you've crunched the numbers and you've written your manuscript, you've gone through the review process, you've survived the multiple rounds of revision, and you get this paper published in a competitive journal. So what happens next? Unfortunately, some of the statistics are a little bit scary, and this is an article from Smithsonian Magazine that says that half of academic papers are only read by their authors and the journal editors, which is pretty distressing, I think, as um, an academic uh, physician and scientist. Um, you do a lot of these projects, your passion projects, to try to share information and hopefully impact care that patients receive. So how do you let people know about your work? I think there are many traditional ways of doing this, but I think that we also live in a modern age where um, we use digital tools all the time. So why shouldn't this be an area where we try to leverage the power of digital tools? This is an interesting article that was uh, published in the Journal of Medical and Internet Research that looks at the correlation between highly tweeted papers and eventual citations. And I pulled up this figure just because I think it's fairly fairly obvious you know, what the time lag is between social media attention and the eventual citations. So once a paper comes out, if that is highly tweeted, if the authors, if other scientists, uh, if physicians in that particular area are talking about it on social media platforms, that generates a lot of attention initially, immediately after the paper comes out. It takes a long time for that citation or for that paper to actually get cited in a paper, as you can see here. Um, it really doesn't pick up for about 300 days. Um, and that's not surprising because in order for a paper to get cited, it has to be read by others who are actually in the process of writing another paper. And then that paper that cites the paper that you published has to go through the submission, the review process, and then eventually get published into a journal to count as a citation. And so that lag, not surprisingly, is at a minimum months, and but can actually be in the order of years. And why do citations matter? Is if you're in, in an academic department and you're looking at the development of reputation as the means to try to demonstrate your criteria for promotion, then citations matter. They, they matter not just um, to you as an individual, because of course, you know, we, we also are rated by our citations in academics, looking at our H indices um, or I-10 index, but we also know that the journals care a lot about citations as well, because citations um, in comparison to the number of cited works goes into the impact factor, and the impact factor determines the ranking of that journal, which is very important to journals and journal publishers. So I thought I would talk about social media um, in the positive light and talk specifically about potential benefits you know, for academic physicians. And then I'm gonna, I'll give you a few practical tips um, in this short time that we have. So let's first talk about some of the social media benefits. We know that social media really encompasses, encompasses a universe of online applications. They include websites, they include apps on mobile devices that enable users to create and share content. Um, it, they can also be used for social networking. But this definition of creating and sharing content um, really includes a variety of different platforms, some of which maybe we haven't really thought about in terms of social media. And I'll give you some practical uh, examples of where I've found that social media has benefits. Now, I'm an academic uh, physician, and my specialty area of expertise is regional anesthesia and acute pain medicine. And just in my particular niche field, I tried to look at how many articles there are to try to keep up with. And yeah, this is a figure that we included in an editorial where we just looked at the number of PubMed cited uh, references that included plain block in the title. And this is just one subset of regional anesthesia, but you can see in the last couple of years, there have been hundreds of articles per year published just using plain block. 
So you have to think, well, how are you keeping up with the literature and how are you leveraging these online tools to help curate information that will help you as a researcher and scientist? And I think when we think when we consider social media platforms, you know, they are ubiquitous and you know, the most common platforms continue to be uh, Facebook and YouTube, YouTube being number one. Um, but there's a, a number of platforms in this middle section, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, um, TikTok, you know, that are rising in popularity, um, and a few of which have only been tracked by the Pew Institute for a year or two. Um, but I think the, the utilization of social media um, is becoming much more mainstream, and many of our trainees and even early career faculty have grown up with social media um, as the means for, uh, for social networking. And so this has become part of popular culture and is also transforming the way that we view um, academic medicine and science. So YouTube is not a big platform that I use, although I have a YouTube channel. Um, during the COVID pandemic, this became a good place for me to house some of the recorded lectures that I had um, as all of our live meetings went online. Um, and, and I think that this is also a good place to use some of those educational materials to help further your reputation as well. You know, many of our talks that we spend hours and hours and hours preparing for, you know, they'll only be heard by a limited number of people in the audience. Um, some of our uh, talks that we give internally for our trainees or for our own department um, will end up just living on your computer, um, where if you actually took the time to try to record that talk and then upload it on YouTube, then that now becomes something that uh, can be shared with others that uh, many others around the world can learn from and also can help further your reputation as an expert in that particular domain. Now, I think in terms of social media, because there are so many platforms, most people tend to break down their use of certain platforms for personal versus professional use. So for example, Facebook, Instagram are commonly used for personal use, and while you know, many people, um, at least you know, that, uh, as a result of this very small survey, you know, will attest to using Twitter for professional use. Uh, my own personal bias is that I tend to prefer using uh, Twitter for professional use only. Now, the use of Twitter is relatively new for me. I mean, I only started using it um, in 2013, and it was in relationship to um, an academic meeting that was occurring at the time. Um, and over the, over the years, I've learned um, you know, much more about the Twitter culture and how to leverage it um, in a way that not only is um, enriching for me as a physician and as a researcher, um, but also allows me to share my ideas, thoughts, and also support others um, through various types of campaigns that are shared through social media. Um, I've written a number of different articles about how you can leverage social media and specifically the Twitter platform for physicians and researchers. And so I just refer you to um, you know, this particular article and others. But uh, I would just summarize by saying that um, there is a huge advantage to using these types of social media platforms and specifically Twitter to have real time global interactions, to have conversations with experts, colleagues in the same field or other fields outside of your domain um, for real, real time, almost real time interaction um, for learning and networking, uh, for answering questions, for posing questions. And this really helps enrich um, your particular career um, as it has mine, just because we're all lifelong learners. And I think that we can all learn from each other, um, as well as you know, consider various perspectives on uh, and various and different areas in science. I also think that you know, the the positive use of social media, especially for um, a, a researcher or scientist who's trying to produce academic work that changes practice um, is very important. They should go together. So yeah, I mentioned before from the same paper that this idea of public interest, of generating those tweetations, you know, that social media sharing, um, that actually can lead and is highly correlated um, with citations down the road. And it makes sense, I think, for a couple of reasons. I think this is bi-directional. So on the one hand, if you have a uh, an article that you publish that that's in a, a hot area of science, then that should generate some attention. The, the more attention that gets, the more people are likely to read it. And then more likely that similar researchers in the same field will incorporate that reference into their manuscript and eventual publication. And then that paper gets cited. In addition, 
if you're using social media and, and paying attention and engaging in conversation where you're not just a passive user um, in which you're just uh, putting out self-promoting activity or just consuming um, social media from you know, as a you know, using it as a news feed, then you're actually contributing to conversations and you're paying attention to what's timely. And so, yeah, I think the observation aspect of social media, um, observing, engaging in conversation, allows you as a researcher um, to know which topics are of interest um, and may be worth pursuing in terms of future studies. The journals also pay attention to social media shares as well. And many of our popular journals have the Altmetric score and Altmetric is a London-based company, um, but that score incorporates in many of the other outlets that um, that are that showcase a particular paper. So far in advance of, uh, of an actual citation, you'll see shares on social media platforms. You see how they're broken down by uh, Facebook, by Twitter, um, also blog posts that discuss a particular paper. Um, in addition, you know, lay, lay news press or, or news outlets, um, you know, also, you know, they also factor into the altmetric score and can really drive an altmetric score. Uh, this particular paper in regional anesthesia and pain medicine by Dr. Graff and colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania um, has the highest altmetric score in regional anesthesia and pain medicine journals history. Um, and Dr. Graff was interviewed on the BBC and it was covered by other mainstream news outlets and um, that really drew a lot of attention to this one particular article. And this is just a single n equals one case study. This is my uh, publication history and citation history since I started my academic career. I didn't publish my first paper until I was an attending. I didn't know that I was going to be interested in academic medicine as a trainee. And so my first case report in 2004 uh, was published after I'd finished my training. And then I went and I did a master's in clinical research while I was working as an attending at UC San Diego. Uh, but since then, um, yeah, I've been involved in a number of clinical trials as well as other projects um, that have led to publication. And you can see where I started my Twitter account in 2013. And of course, this is not causal by any means. Um, but as I mentioned, I think that there is something bidirectional about the use of social media. I think on the one hand, uh, when you publish a paper that's timely and topical, you can share that and you can also include and mention people who may be interested in the same field to start discussing your article. That also allows people who are in the same area of science to know about your paper and then consider referencing it so that way it gets cita cited later. And you can see how that trend of publications and citations increases together. Um, and I think in addition, as I mentioned, as a researcher on social media, I'm using it because I use Twitter regularly, I also pay close attention to what people are talking about. So that helps me understand which topics are timely and which ones may be worth pursuing, um, either as a research study um, or other form of, of manuscript. And this is just one practical example. Um, I've had many, but this is one that, uh, that comes to mind very quickly. Um, there was a Twitter conversation a couple of years ago about uh, how the regional anesthesia field has changed so much, and yet the minimum requirements for peripheral nerve block experience for our residents in the United States through ACGME haven't changed. We still are required to have a minimum of 40 experiences managing patients with peripheral nerve blocks. Well, when I was a resident and we didn't have ultrasound and people didn't put catheters in, you could realistically do four different blocks 10 times each, and maybe you would feel proficient in performing those four blocks. But today with ultrasound, you can put local anesthetic anywhere. And so you could realistically have 40 different nerve blocks and have only performed them one time each. And so um, a friend and colleague of mine, Lloyd Turbot, who's a, an anesthetist um, in Belfast, had commented that 100% of an anesthesiologists who are competent in five blocks is better than having 1% of anesthesiologists competent in 100 blocks. And it goes to the importance, I think, of trying to spread what we do to impact patient care. And this led to an, an editorial that uh, Lloyd and I, as well as um, you know, Dr. Kareem El Bogdali, who's a consultant anesthetist at Guys in St. Thomas's Trust in London, you know, wrote for the journal Anesthesia. Um, that editorial, um, it really formed the basis of the Regional Anesthesia United Kingdom's uh, Plan A Blocks um, you know, workshop uh, direction, as well as um, cognitive aids to help uh, further um, promote basic blocks you know, for all anesthesiologists. Um, that led to an international study in which you know, we 
put together a group of experts around the world to using a Delphi process to try to determine you know, what would be um, a basic non-fellowship curriculum you know, for regional anesthesia for any anesthesiologist. And this was uh, published in Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine at the conclusion of, it, of that work. So let's just talk about a couple practical tips uh, and then I'll uh, leave, the, leave the rest for the discussion. So a couple of things I think that are very important to remember. So social media um, is never an emergency. So yeah, anytime that you're not sure about posting or tweeting, then just pause. Think about it. You know, don't do it when you're emotional. Um, make sure that you're accurate. Um, I like to proofread over and over and over um, before um, I send any, I post anything on Instagram or, or I uh, tweet um, anything. I think it's important that you respect patient privacy. So that is an absolute, uh, absolute rule for social media um, in the healthcare setting. And I also think that, you know, that sometimes social media posts lack nuance. So always assume good, um, you know, unless proven otherwise, and just uh, educate yourself. So spend some time observing um, before you start to engage in conversation. So a couple of things I think are easy on the to-do list. So I'm personally biased towards the use of Twitter. I find it very helpful um, as an academic physician. Um, also the size of the post is small, so it's easily digestible. Um, so I would recommend just starting your account um, and then edit the handle. So initially your username is um, some element of your name plus a bunch of numbers. So edit that so that way it includes your full name and degrees. Write a brief profile just so that way people know that it's you. Um, if you happen to be giving a presentation or you write a paper, um, yeah, if you're someone like me, I always try to see if those people are on Twitter. So that way when I share their work, um, either at a meeting or I'm gonna tweet about a paper that they publish, I like to give them credit. Um, add a photo again, so that way people can identify who you are and just follow a couple of accounts and see how people use that platform. Um, and you learn a lot about um, you know, the etiquette on that type of a, a social media format. And if you get to tweeting, then here are a couple of pro tips. And this is from a friend and colleague, Jeff Gadsden, who's at Duke University. Um, make sure if you're at a meeting like this one, that you include the relevant hashtag. So uh, the meeting, um, meeting planners you know, should um, always advertise with the meeting hashtag on all of their materials and websites. So that way attendees always know if there's a, a hashtag being used. Uh, this helps group the conversations for that meeting and makes them easily searchable. And if you have a topic that you think is of interest to other people, then mention them. As I mentioned, as I said earlier, if you have um, a paper that people are uh, talking about, or you know that someone has published a paper, then I usually include their uh, Twitter handle in my in my tweet. Um, also include images. So images yeah, are known to draw more attention to a particular post, um, and they're more likely to be retweeted. And then you can also use that, uh, that image to tag other people. So in case you, there are many other um, accounts uh, and, and people who may be interested in that particular topic, you can help draw attention to your tweet um, using the tag feature. The other thing that I just wanna say, even though my topic is self-promotion, is that it really shouldn't be about self-promotion only. Um, use social media for good, use it to promote others. You know, find people who are doing great work um, and elevate them. And this is really a great opportunity. As you start to gain followers, then you start to have an audience. And um, that's a, I, I find that is uh, one of our obligations, I think to try to uh, lift others up you know, who are doing great things and really are deserving of that kind of attention. So I've tried to use my own social media platforms to help promote other people, to help promote uh, underrepresented uh, minorities and women in medicine and science, um, as well as try to um, draw a rightful attention to causes and campaigns um, that you know, help elevate others and try to um, create equity in, in medicine and science. And if you have any questions about getting started on social media, this is a page on my website that gives some hope, uh, some basic tips and tricks, as well as some links to some helpful resources. And of course, I'm always easy to find if any of you have any questions about the use of social media. Um, yeah, there, are no, there are no dumb questions. So um, anyone getting started is, is welcome to come and reach out to me as well. Yeah, thank you so much for being part of this session. <laughs>